Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody, to the Health and Adult Social Care Overview and Scrutiny, 3rd of March. Um, just before we start, I'm going to go through um, our um, just stuff that we have to talk about before we start, which is welcoming everybody here. Uh, we're just going to do some housekeeping. The first thing is the fire alarm. So a, f a fire practice is not expected. If the alarm sounds, can all present leave the building as quickly as possible by the way of the nearest exits? And the designated assembly point is the public square in front of CAST, uh, beyond the fountain, away from the civic office. If there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated at the left-hand side to the lift doors to call for assistance. There'll be no roll call taken. Thank you. Uh, mobile phones, could everybody ensure that they're switched off and silent mode? There is filming of this meeting that will be visually recorded and will be available to view on the Council's website and YouTube channel. Please, can everyone present use their microphones to ensure that the audio can be captured? Any members of the public entering the Council chamber accepting that their images will be retained and broadcast by the Council. Um, we don't have any public in attendance right now. Um, please note that we need to observe COVID safety protocols. Officers are free to leave the meeting once their item has been concluded. But can I please ask you to sanitize your desks, uh, consoles and microphones with the wipes before you leave. And this will enable other officers who may be attending later to use your seats. You do not need to wear a mask when seated. However, please can you wear one when moving around the chamber. Thank you so much. Um, so now I'll begin the agenda. Um, the first one is, uh, are there any apologies for absence? And I have Councillor Sean Gibbons, uh, Rupert Sucklin and Phil Holmes. And Councillor Kersley. And Councillor Kersley. Thank you. Um, number two is to consider the extent in, if any, to which the public and press are to be excluded from the meeting and there's no issues on the agenda. Number three is to declare uh, any interests. So if anybody does have an interest, please can you declare this and uh, Christine here will give you a form to be completed uh, following the meeting and can assist you with that process. And number four is public statements, but we have no public attending. And that takes us straight on to number five, which is item five, HEF Health Protection Assurance Annual Report 2021-22. That's pages one to 44 in the uh, information pack. And our officers are Victor and um, and I would like to invite Victor up for, for the presentation. We were just saying that we'd like um, to just get straight into questions unless there's anything extra on the agenda um, that, that we didn't get in the pack, just so that we've got enough time to go through the um, questions. Is that okay? Brilliant, fantastic. Um, so our first question is, um, but from Councillor Laura Bluff. Thank you, Chair. Morning, panel. Um, given the recent legal changes regarding COVID, what are the protocols now being advised from the public health um, regarding things like um, visitors supporting uh, patients? Thank you for your question. Um, just uh, if I can just give a quick uh, overview. Um, this um, this agenda around uh, annual health protection to the scrutiny panel. We've been doing it for the last um, almost a decade. A decade, uh, and so it's always a pleasure to come and uh, share with you uh, what's happening around the health protection um, ag agenda. Obviously, the last two years has been uh, focus focus on COVID, uh, and really we've been all very busy. And you are right. One of the key um, challenges had been the changes in guidance. When you mean when you say visiting, did you mean things like care homes, 
for did you mean visiting in any setting? Um, things like people being there to be able to support um, a patient, like going through A&E. So if somebody arrives um, either by a relative bringing them or via ambulance and they need somebody there to support them, will that now be allowed? Yeah. Uh, obviously, during the current uh, changes, a very setting institute, some kind of safety measure to protect patients. Um, and hospital is, is, is one, one of them. Uh, I don't know the detail in terms of um, uh, what uh, mechanism the hospital management is going to put in place, but there has been um, uh, ch ch uh, changes that have been put in place to ensure that uh, it is safe for both the visitors and also to, for those in, in the wards, where they put limit, for example, uh, people going into wards and so forth. That is to protect um, the, the patients in, in there. But clearly, uh, they, they will review this accordingly. It, they will have information on the on the website in terms of what the current policy is, uh, and I'm sure um, you can, anybody can look it up there for up to date um, changes in in policy. It was also kind of um, being um, uh, to to give a wider context. Uh, it's not only hospital. Uh, we have care homes, for example, in terms of where we have vulnerable people they do have protocols in place, as you can see, imagine, to protect uh, the vulnerable residents. So visit, visiting is allowed, uh, mm -hmm. but, but visitors have to go follow uh, precautions. Where there are outbreaks, uh, the, those restrictions are put in place, um, but still a mechanism to allow visiting does happen uh, with, with some kind of uh, stringent precautions, such as testing before people go to, to care settings. So, so yes, we, as, although, although the government has lifted uh, the broader restriction uh, from guidance point of view, for safety point of view, uh, we are mind, mindful to, to main, ensure that we, have, um, we protect our vulnerable uh, residents, including those in hospital and in care homes as well. So maintaining uh, a precautionary approach um, so that so that anybody who who has who is unwell or maybe having those COVID symptoms, not advised to go to to those settings, but obviously in settings mm -hmm. such as care homes, there is testing also as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, Victor. Um, our second question is from Councillor Corey. Morning. Thank you very much. Question is, is there a register of people in Doncaster who are suffering from long COVID, particularly concerning for young people who would be losing employment and education? How will they be supported? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Corinne. Cor um, it's good that we've got our, our colleagues in the CCG also here. Um, th there is there is a, a service in place to kind of uh, look after um, patients with, with, with long COVID. Uh, as to register, uh, I'll, I'll pass on to my colleague here, who is, um, uh, who is with us here, whether, whether we have uh, actual register, but we are, cons we are aware uh, of the concern, um, the long-term impact of, of COVID and our, um, our primary care system uh, is responding to, uh, to to that needs. Uh, if I kind of pass a quick comment to uh, my colleague, um, Ed. Uh, thank you. Um, in terms of a composite register, I'm not aware that there is one in one single place, but each GP practice will identify those people who have um, uh, got ongoing problems with long COVID um, and may have been referred into the service. So we have a, a single service model of uh, for long COVID, so that will be one place where people have been referred to. Now, if people haven't been referred into that service, then they won't obviously be on that known to that single list, but may be known to the GP. So they will be identifiable within the system. Um, but I'm not aware of a single composite list of everybody that's identifying themselves as having long COVID. Um, but they'll be able to access direct support through their GP and primary care services and referred into the bespoke long COVID service. Um, 
concern is for, uh, well, for everyone with long COVID, it's ME type illness, and some are minor, and some and some people are very severe. Um, with our young people, could be losing uh, education, and they've already lost two years, and losing employment with this. Um, you did say that the you've got something in place. What exactly will be happening with these people? Would they treatment or um, just registered that they're not well? Do, is it registered within um, the DWP because they've got an illness? Uh, on how far does it go? Do we know yet? Yeah, we do know that the, the impact of COVID is quite, um, um, as, as you know, short term, but also long term which we don't know the wider implications. And you are right in terms of highlighting the impact on things like education, work, and people's level of concentration. Um, the level of support needs to be tailored according to the, to the needs of those individuals. And I think for educational settings as well, it's, it's more about awareness. It's not only um, the students or pupil, even some, some staff, because, um, um, being mindful of the impact of, of uh, staff workload and, and what uh, they may not be as performing as they used to be, it is kind of worth recognizing those kind of limitations. And that also applies to other wider settings in terms of the, 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 the workforce. Um, some people, they may finish their isolation period, they're fine. And, and in fact, some of them actually uh, may not have symptoms and are okay to work, for example, from, work, from, from, from home. So we need to be cognizant and respond accordingly, both to the short-term, medium, and long-term impact of, of, of COVID, and be understanding because we don't know much about some of this implication, and it's not the same from, from one person to the other. So the short answer to your question is um, the, the response to those needs need to be tailored according to the condition. That's why um, a closer um, working with um, the health service uh, GPs particularly, uh, who can be able to kind of support from the medical side of things, but it's beyond the medical aspect of things as well, the impact uh, in terms of if it is students, maybe um, st uh, the teachers need to be cognizant about um, those particular stu uh, students. And if, if it is uh, staff as well, for example, those teaching staff, uh, the, the colleagues and head teachers need to be aware about those uh, long-term impact. So, so it, because it does have impact on performance. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've got one more question. The clarification of time frame for breast screening. What is the practice after the age of 70? For those who have missed the screening process during COVID, will the time scale be extended? I'll pass over to my colleague from NHS England, um, um, Sarah Jill, uh, can introduce herself and then, and then pick up some of those questions. The reason being um, the, the screening program and immunization program, um, NHS England lead on it. Hello, yeah, I'm Sarah Gill and I'm the screening immunization coordinator. I'm covering Doncaster, as say I work for NHS England, mm -hmm. um, which commission all the, the screening programs. Um, as far as, as um, anybody over the age of 70, um, if they still want to actually have breast screening, they can actually um, uh, you know, uh, ring up and book an appointment uh, and actually go for breast screening, especially if they've, they've missed um, their screening during COVID, if they've not felt able to go for an appointment, then they can, they can ring up um, the department and, and book an appointment. to the time when you have a breast screen, you usually get letters to come out to, to, to inform you that you're, you're about due for your breast screening. Will some of them letters be backdated to bring these uh, residents forward who, has, who have missed the screening and now have reached the age of 70? Will it be a catch-up that they can, you'll be informing them that they're due for their 
the breast screening appointment. Thank you. Uh, we are in the process of looking at all the um, ladies who might have missed um, coming in to actually have their screening, particularly over the last two years, uh, and there will be invites going out um, to women to make sure that they come in and get their screening, even if they have turned um, 70, they'll still be within the programme. Thank you, Councillor Corrin. Uh, Councillor Knowles. Thank you. Um, in the report on page 24, um, 7.1, there's a, a bit about um, adolescent immunisations, and it says um, the impact of delivering the second phase of the adolescent COVID-19 vaccination programme has the potential to adversely affect the routine adolescent vaccination programmes due to commence in February 22. I just wondered what those routine adolescent vaccination programmes were. Hi, so the routine adolescent immunisations are basically the uh, diphtheria, tetanus and polio vaccine and the men, men ACWY vaccine, which um, they will be delivering um, very soon. Meningitis, yeah, and the, uh, and also um, HPV, which is the human papillomavirus vaccine against cervical cancer. I'm afraid we're not um, au fait with all the te technology terminology. Sorry. I'd just like to bring you in. Yeah, thank, thank you. Just to, to add on, on that, obviously it, it is a risk that we are extremely aware of and we are working really closely with our school providers to make sure that um, those programmes aren't impacted and that all the children that should be, the adolescents that should be vaccinated by the 31st of August are completed as they would, would have been pre-pandemic. So um, we are really aware of it and we are working really closely with school providers to make sure that um, that adverse impact that we're aware of doesn't actually materialise. Thank you. Thank you both of you for that answer to that question. Thank you. Um, so, you have another question. I have another question. Um, on page 33, um, the the uh, stuff about syphilis. So there's a table, table seven, and I can't make head or tail of it. Sorry, I just don't know what it, what it means. Could somebody talk me through it? Okay. <clears throat> what you see there is um, um, the trend, what we call trend over time, uh, from 2012 to 2020. Um, and what you see uh, in the uh, column which says count is the actual number of cases. Uh, the reason why um, those four first bit were blocked out is because they are less than five, so 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 that uh, they are not identified. Um, and then um, from 2016, you can see that there has been quite a, a gradual um, increase, uh, although not significant uh, in the sense uh, from 15. To 20, it, it ranges from 15 to 22, the highest in 2019. Uh, so that's the actual count. Uh, we, from from public health point of view, we tend to put um, figures uh, in the context of the population. And so the next one, is where you see its value, is the is the rate per um, per head of population. So, so that is what actually, when you are beginning to compare one area and the other, or over time, that is what we look at. And, and as you can see there, um, the rates of um, syphilis um, incident has gradually been increasing. And, and I think the broader message there is, um, if you just look at the, uh, the last paragraph above that table seven, it says in 2021, there has been 32 cases. So from, from where we have the um, cases kind of increasing by a, a handful, um, 
last year uh, is 32. Uh, it's kind of um, uh, shows that there's been quite a significant increase and it's something that we need to look at. Thank you. What are these 95% lower CI and upper CI? Okay. Um, the 95% uh, uh, confident interval is statistical um, presentation because when, when you look at um, a rate in isolation, because the number is low, um, there is variation. Uh, so it is really a statistical measure to tell us what is the, the lowest range and what is the highest range. And then it's, it's really the confidence at which we would say um, a particular true value lies. So if, if I take the example of 2022, the rate is 6.7. Um, what this one is saying is if you look at the 95% lower, CI stands for confidence interval, it's abbreviation. Uh, and then the upper is the upper end. It means the true the true uh, mean lies between 4.2 and 10.3. So, so basically, because a small number, uh, some of these cases might have not been reporting themselves. To, we don't know about. And it may quite be possible, uh, although we, we say 30, 21 in cases in 2020, 2020 and the actual rate is 6.7, there's a chance that actually um, we may have it a bit lower than that or we could be ha higher than that so it the true the true rate would lie between somewhere 4.2 to 10.3 that's what it means okay thank you thank you thank you so much victor for that i think we were all a little bit stumped what the uh, lower ci uh, percentages were so it's actually really good to know for the future how yeah. uh, public health sort of read those uh, um, do, do a population sort of a statistic across. Yeah, That's, thank you. Thank you. No problem. Um, Councillor Corrie. Thank you. HIV cases is reported to be one in eight who don't know they have HIV. Is there an awareness campaign to assist or is the one uh, publicly in the future to be brought out to the communities? Yeah, um, I know HIV AIDS had been um, around, people know about it, decades, um, in terms of the wave of um, epidemic when it first came. Uh, now the service embedded in t in terms of part of the routine kind of sexual health uh, services so uh, and also other services as well for example TB services uh, a lot of patients who um, would come um, and present for other sexual services they will have opportunity to discuss um, screening for HIV as well and similarly for there is an indicator for people, uh, we do know that um, things like TB cases, that is kind of close association as well. Uh, a lot of people who, because they kind of reduce immunity and so forth, um, it's, it's routinely also they check for HIV. So um, that measure in terms of picking cases up, in terms of um, detection and so forth, is embedded into routine uh, delivery of things like sexual health service or TB uh, um, t t TB treatment or, sc uh, or screening in order to pick some of these cases up. The broader message in terms of um, prevention still remain the same in terms of safer sex and, and awareness and all that kind of thing. Um, we, uh, we continue to advocate uh, that through our uh, the services we commission. Um, Increase, increase awareness, but also uh, even in, uh, among um, um, the younger population and particularly uh, uh, population that are at risk. Um, our uh, services work with, for example, uh, injecting drug users and that kind of thing because uh, it's also a mode of transmission of, of the infection. So we embed the message around prevention and also detection as part of 
the services we commissioned. Thank you. Um, I know a big, big steps have been made in a lot of years with the um, HIV programme and treatments, which have been wonderful for people. But one in, eight, one in eight is still quite a large number, what's been reported. And because of the 18-month, two-year lockdown, a lot of things have been forgotten. So I am just wondering if there is um, an aware, awareness campaign um, to come out to the public to put this back into people's thoughts um, of the behaviours and treatments what's out there for them so people can have uh, some re reassurance when they come to the, the clinics um, because one in eight is quite a large number of people. Thank you, Vic. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, our uh, services... Um, we built our awareness on that. We'll continue to do to do that. Um, our lead uh, commissioner on uh, on this uh, subject area um, will we'll, we'll pick that up as part of um, or reinforce the message about the increased awareness uh, of HIV uh, among the, the the clients group. Also, there is um, uh, so there's a national uh, uh, campaign that we tacked onto in terms of safer sex and that kind of thing, which uh, help in terms of promoting the, uh, the, the awareness of, of the issue. So yes, um, the public health awareness campaign is embedded as part of uh, the service and we'll continue to kind of um, ensure that um, our services um, pick that up um, and um, working with our uh, comms in terms of amplifying that message. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Um, our next question comes from Councillor Moran. Thank you, Chair. Um, following on, really, from that last question, there seems to be problems for people accessing sexual health clinic already. Um, through pandemic, you know, the safety measures and everything. But when people, it's taking people up to four weeks to actually get an answer and get an appointment, how many people are actually turning up and getting screened? Because if people are struggling to get the regular contraception, let alone be screened, it, it, it seems to be in a pretty poor state at the moment. I just hope that there's some plan to really get that out there, to try and pick up these extra possible cases from the lockdown. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, it's, it's a good point. The lockdown has got quite an impact in terms of how people access services. Um, and, and I think uh, as time um, goes by, um, the lockdown is easing. People are adjusting in terms of addressing some of those concerns in terms of access uh, to, to services. Um, in terms of being instead remotely, uh, more and more kind of opportunity for face to, uh, face to face, and even exploring what works uh, remotely, how we can make those options available. But more important lesson, as you said, um, opening up the, um, so that more people feel more confident to be confident to be able to contact um, the uh, the professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, uh, Tracy. Um, do you have any uh, question, ex extension questions on that? Are you happy with that answer? I don't think there's anything really. It, we're all in an unusual place right now until, especially the changeover with the sexual health um, team as well. So we'll have to wait and see and hope that these young people in particular come forward and persist. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question uh, is, uh, so I was really interested to see about um, that, the Carcroft, I can't, I'm not very good at saying this word, colopscopy. Thank you. <laughs> um, service will end on the 31st of March. And, uh, and then that capacity then goes on to Doncaster um, Teaching Hospital. 
uh, whilst the uh, public consultation takes place. I just wonder if you could uh, expand on this. Is it about whether that service is uh, in the right place? And if it turns out it's in the right place, will it go back to Carcroft? Um, and obviously we'll be transferring into the integrated care system in that time as well. So just wondering about those kind of uh, issues and access to that kind of service. Can I pass to my colleague? Can I bring Kathy in? Yeah, so um, routinely colposcopy services are carried out in um, acute trusts in secondary care. Um, across Yorkshire and Humber, there are only a couple of community colposcopy clinics, Carcroft being one of them. The problem is, is that you need a specialised, a specialist kind of workforce to carry out colposcopy services. Um, and sustaining that within primary care within a GP practice is extremely difficult to do. Um, the service at Carcroft has been, been really, really good. Um, it's been high quality, it's been well received by, by patients. The numbers are relatively small, um, but because of obviously aging workforce and people retiring, um, the, the sustainability of that within primary care is, is just not doable, but the numbers are small. And as I said, the, the, the number of community colposcopy clinics, as I said, there's, there's a couple across Yorkshire and Humber, so um, it, it is kind of a, a, an exception rather than the norm. Um, the, the norm is secondary care because they've got the infrastructure, they've got the workforce, they've got the specialism to be able to deliver that. Oh, that's uh, brilliant. Thank, thank you for um, explaining that. Um, was the public consultation part of it um, that it says in then? Is it just about the service in general? Yeah, I, I, I've not been directly involved with it to be fair. I think the, the, the practice spoke to their patients. Again, it, they, they've got a very um, tight relationship with, with patients. Um, so I think that the consultation's kind of been done more informally with the practice rather than it being a, a big patient engagement, um, again, because of the small numbers that, that are affected. Brilliant, thank you for that. And um, another question from Councillor Curry. Sorry about this. Um, substance misuse. Has there been an increase during lockdown? Are we aware of any increase or any problems around um, substance misuse through the lockdown? Our service had been kind of stable, I would say. Uh, the challenges that we've, we've had, um, our, our team have been kind of engaged with it in terms of the provider services. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, things have gone or, or things have increased uh, in a way. Uh, it is really about ensuring that um, supporting patient, uh, patient in that journey of recovery. Uh, and and it's, 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 it's a difficult uh, journey, particularly for those who are involved, because it's not like um, uh, something that um, takes a week or two, sometimes takes months to get some of these people out. Uh, you can see that some of the uh, initiative there, um, for example, um, the issue of litter in one of the um, one of the 100 hours pharmacy where they can go and get uh, substitutes uh, substance subs, uh, substitute. Um, the issue was about the litter and and that has been worked collaboratively with the people around and 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 managed and and that's kind of a, a, a good successful way how to safely ensure that. Um, um, it is safe and also, as, as, I mean, the, the image of the people or the environment around, particularly when, when some of those needles are kind of left um, around and the neighbors were concerned about that. So they've addressed that issue. Uh, and the other thing is about um, when they take um, uh, substitute substances home, how to ensure that it is kept safe as well. Uh, and, and they've worked on that. So um, short answer to your question is, um, uh, we are not seeing a dramatic increase in the cases. Um, the service is still, is, still, is still there in terms of uh, ensuring that effective uh, support is available to support um, uh, people in the, treat in the journey of the treatment and, and exit. Thank you, Tim. 
Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Cap Councillor Curran. Um, just to expand on that, I was wondering about um, the project free um, service that we have, and it says that it has had increased usage. And I was just wondering on the trends of that, whether we expect it to continue on in the ad in the adolescent population and, and what things we've got in place if we think that trend is going to continue. Um, so the project three is kind of, um, it's one of the initiatives to kind of support young people uh, in, in, in the range of um, uh, challenges they're facing in terms of either the use of um, alcohol, substance misuse and so forth. Uh, clearly, it's been a difficult time because of the COVID, particularly and young people as well. Um, but the service still remain there uh, in terms of the the, uh, the support av uh, available, uh, which include I think like substance misuse, but also sexual health services where children need the space to be able to discuss with um, the prof pro professionals. So um, the service is. is I remain agile in terms of ensuring that uh, during this pandemic and as things um, is, the service kind of is, is flexible to, to ensure that uh, the needs of the young people are, are, are met. Obviously, the issue with um, uh, the lockdown is um, uh, peop the, uh, the, the issue of remote, um, remote uh, working uh, and where opportunity for face-to-face -face may be a bit limited, but but I think as things is is now, uh, those challenges are, are being uh, taken up in terms of ensuring that young people have got um, opportunity to be able to both remote and also face-to-face um, -face discussion with um, the trusted professionals. That's brilliant, thank you. I have heard really fantastic things about Project Free, so I was just uh, hoping that um, it was getting the support and um, that it's, you know, it's obviously quite easy access, accessible for young people that need it. Um, it's not on this list, but I was wondering, Victor, if uh, we could get an update, whether that's just an email about the or access to audiology services it probably doesn't fall under your remit but i did notice that diabetic screening was on there and we've been getting quite a bit about um people having poor access to audiology services especially over covid brilliant thank you so much and um i just wanted to know if the panel had any other extra questions um, Councillor Greenhow. Uh, yes. Uh, good. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Victor, for the presentation. Uh, really, it's aimed at yourself. Um, on page thirty-five, what, what we've been talking about are uh, take up of uh, uh, different groups and factions uh, for, for remedial treatment and help. Uh, but the the graph on the page thirty-five more or less states it all. We have an age range of uh, sexual partners and the conurbations of different types. Uh, and it seems that the source, the, the smaller, the smaller addition, is the younger group. Ever after that, it goes up and down like a yo-yo, uh, which is of a considerable cost to society and, 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 and uh, personal um, um, well-being, and, and also cost money-wise. Mm -hmm. um, would it not be, and it may not be your actual remit, but you are, you've indicated that you, you appreciate this, that a, a more user user by information technology friendly uh, a more normalized approach to the education process of young adults and older adolescents would pay greatly in, in prevention rather than the cure and if there, if, there, if you have any knowledge is there any such educational ideas or input to be able to achieve what uh, I've suggested Thank you. You are referring to the graph um, on page 35? Yeah, um, which is the uh, HIV civil self sampling uh, um, issue. Yeah, good, good point in terms of. Um, 
uh, the issue how we can tackle this through our education system. Um, we, we do have um, services um, that are embedded in terms of kind of awareness as part of, as part of the health promotion uh, initiative in school. Yes, it's true. Uh, now, our colleague here in terms of some of the preventative aspect in terms of, um, uh, although not necessarily HIV syphilis, but uh, things like chlamydia and so forth, are part of the sexual health um, uh, issues, um, which is of concern. But, but clearly, yes, um, the broader sexual health message is quite important in terms of um, uh, raising the awareness, particularly among uh, young people. Uh, obviously, you can see here in terms of the age, age trend, some of these are kind of either post-university or people working age, um, age 25, 34, um, as opposed to uh, the school age um, level. Also, the, the level of um, uh, education and awareness for children um, um, is in a different context, but f from, the, from the issues here is, is really, uh, yes, awareness, but secondly, it's about access to, to, to service prompt access. Some of this could be um, university level type of education, so they need to be aware. Uh, they need to be informed in terms of uh, the dangers and then the, the uh, uh, danger risk and how they can be able to get those preventative uh, uh, sessions. So it's in, in a way more like package of what universities need to kind of be aware of. And some of these, as you see here in this graph, uh, they are kind of post-university, the Finnish university. So I think that broad message is still, still important in terms of awareness uh, around preventing sex sexual transmitted diseases. Because um, the message needs to be broader as opposed to specific disease because um, um, you don't know what you could encounter. It could be any one of the sexual transmitted diseases. And as long as they are aware about some of the messages around safer sex and that kind of thing, it's quite key in terms of preventing um, uh, a raft of uh, sexual transmitted diseases. I don't know whether my colleagues have got anything to add from the screening uh, perspective. Oh, thank you for that, uh, Victor. The, the reason why I brought that to, uh, to light, it seemed to illustrate here at the, at the start of life, uh, it's a very minimal, and we know the reasons why. But I'm going back from personal experience, I'm a little bit older than most people, uh, and I went to a Catholic school. And they actually segregated at the age of, I think, about 12, the girls from the boys. And they don't want to tell the girls what to do. And the priest told the boys what to do. And we were all sat at the class. So it's like, <laughs> that, that's not a joke. That's the way it was. But the same principle is now. We don't seem to be taking people seriously enough and saying, look, we're not telling you what to do. This happens, this, and, and, and actually give them a, a lecture debate type of it. And, and I would have said from about 13, 14, it's quite normal nowadays. I, I can go with my grandchildren. We try and be very, very frank and open. And, and, and it doesn't seem to me as though it's a big surprise. Oh, I didn't know, I didn't this, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. Oh, could you do this, could you do that? It seems as though there's no knowledge, and it's because it's like a bit of a taboo subject. It's like the drugs thing. I don't know what the correlation is statistically wise with the drug problem and this, but I will guarantee you it's probably not a similar looking graph. The thing is, um, it's a very serious subject and I don't think society and the education system has grasped the nettle actually to be able to say, now look, you know, for the better life, wife, children, partner, success, happiness, blah, blah, blah. But these are the things that you have a perfectly legal right to um, to, to indulge in but these are the consequences uh, for yourself and for others uh, I don't think that is getting over well enough uh, and I know it might not be your remit at this particular session but it's something I've had and when I read this it sort of like brought it all back and I thought I better air my view so uh, I couldn't have picked a better chap than yourself to, because you have got the grasp of it and I'm to see that thank you thank you for that Martin uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Victor, for your answer there. That was brilliant. Um, I just got one more question, which uh, is from uh, Councillor Greenhall here. 
Right, yes, uh, working with uh, all partners to identify inequalities in vaccination uptake. Uh, tell us about the work. In vaccination uptake, could you tell us about the work? It's to uh, working with uh, all partners to identify inequalities in vaccination uptake. Okay. It's a bit different to what I was on about before. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> If, if I start, and my, I bring my colleagues because it's quite wide, um, the most um, important one, obviously, we've got uh, in the past two years, in, in the past year or so, has been um, the COVID vaccination. And, and uh, we are all aware about um, the uh, different hesitancy issues uh, in, the, in the population. So um, at, uh, as with partners, we've worked very hard to ensure that we, we, we reach out um, uh, different strands in terms of um, um, either geographically. Uh, we know particularly the central part of Doncaster is one where the uptake has been quite low, but that's also compounded by uh, maybe uh, people of different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds also here. Uh, as well as different ethnicity, they all have their perception. So uh, we've all worked together with our NHS colleagues, um, the voluntary, um, uh, the council, we mobilize um, to ensure that we, we reach out um, to, the, to those group. It started from also addressing some of the myths as well. Uh, there are, there are um, health beliefs of people for one reason or the other. And, and, and one of the initial work we did was to kind of find out what, what, what do people say, what are the concerns? So we collected those and, and we use those questions or concern to develop communication messages. And, and, and this include both written and also video and also discussion with, uh, with groups. Um, and we have got people who've going, been going out as well. Also with uh, I'm, I'm with those kind of responses we collectively develop. Uh, and our NHS colleagues, has, um, in terms of the, the vaccination, being able to take vaccination to people, nearer to people, was quite useful. So we've helped bridge that gap of inequality. Uh, inequality. Um, one of the slides in the report there shows uh, how we have reduced inequality, uh, even among men and women over time, about among different uh, ethnic groups and um, among level of deprivation in, in the borough. Uh, so that's kind of uh, an important one. Uh, and and I'll, I'll pass over to my colleagues to kind of just describe a little bit the broader um, routine vaccination. Uh, again, has got an inequality aspect uh, and how um, we've gone around uh, doing that. I don't know whether you want to add anything, Sarah, or um, it. Yeah, just, just to build on what Victor said, really, that uh, we've been working all partners together, particularly around the COVID and the flu vaccination programme, um, and, and working with closely with community connectors um, for the Gypsy Roma traveller communities, reaching out, um, looking at both screening and immunisations and seeing how we can actually engage them into coming into um, GP services um, and screening services, and that's an on ongoing piece of work. Um, but there has been, you know, looking at all the inequalities, certainly lots around the COVID vaccine, there's been lots of pop-up clinics going out to different parts of the, um, you know, the, the area just to, you know, to try and identify and help support those people to actually come forward and have their vaccinations. Um, and as Victor said, you know, lots of written information, videos, um, you know, communications, so... Yeah, again, just to, to build on, on what Sarah and Victor have said, um, I think reducing inequalities is a high priority um, for the NHS and for NHS England and, and improvement. So that's absolutely going to build moving forward and, and hopefully we'll gain speed and momentum as, as we come out of the pandemic. Um, we are linked into regional groups, we're linked into national groups around inequalities and looking at what lessons we can learn and how we can implement those locally again across the system and, and with our partners um, in relation to COVID specifically there are um, the, the CCG has a, a, a direct link into um, again regional inequalities groups so inequalities from a COVID vaccination point of view 
is absolutely high on their list in terms and looking at how they can address populations and communities that are underserved, um, people with learning disabilities, um, severe mental health issues, um, or people with autism, for example. And we're also working with our providers across screening and immunisation services um, to develop a health equity, get, asking them to do a health equity audit so that they can really identify what it is that um, it is, is preventing people from accessing those services so that we can put um, a plan in, an appropriate plan in place, again, working um, with local systems and partners, but making sure that that's a, a, slight, a cycli cyclical process um, and not just something that's done at the start of the year so that we can continue to learn and build and, and develop those through, throughout the year as an ongoing process. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, it's great that you mentioned that uh, learning from this process of uh, being able to reach more uh, uh, quote unquote harder to reach uh, groups and taking that learning and applying it to things like screening and other health um, issues. I think that's brilliant. Um, and I'd just like to uh, commend just how um, fantastic all of the, the work has been in Doncaster. In, uh, it is noted that we have quite high uh, vaccine uptakes generally, um, and, and that's uh, thanks to um, all of you and our healthcare and volunteer um, providers across Doncaster, so thank you for that. Um, does the panel have any extra questions before we wrap up? Uh, Councillor Corrin. Thank you. While the government's changing its policies on large on COVID, care homes, will lateral flow kits still be available and undertaken by staff on a regular basis, including patients? Early, early indication uh, is that uh, the government would want to kind of protect um, testing uh, in, in care homes. Um, I suppose also in, in hospital as well. Um, uh, particularly, that, that would be the need for um, staff, for example, who need to, to do the regular uh, testing. They, 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 they uh, say they are going to come back again with the detail of um, which group they are going to consider um, as kind of vulnerable, uh, where they would kind of allow some testing to continue. Uh, but care home is one of them. Uh, in terms of allowing um, that process to continue. Because um, through the pandemic, the care homes has, you know, seem to have been a great concern to a lot of people with, so if we continue with the lateral flow kits um, for patients and staff, that would be really helpful. And so thank you. Thank you too. Thank you so much for all of your time today. It's been really great to um, hear uh, about the progress. We really appreciate the uh, report that was sent. It's clear that there's a lot of time and effort that's been put into it to give us all the information, which was fantastic. Um, and uh, we'd just like to thank you as the panel for your time today and answering all of our questions. And uh, we look forward to um, seeing the information about audiology. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next uh, agenda item is number six, which is um, the quality of adult social care services, including the COVID response, which is on pages 45 to 62. And we've got uh, Caroline Nice, Assistant Director today. As the chair said, I'm Karen Nice, I'm the Assistant Director for Adult Social Care. I'm not great with technology, so we'll see what happens. Is this close enough? Is that better? Yeah, okay, fab. I'll try and sit this way. It feels strange with the audience over there. 
So um, I've come to talk to you about the registered care provision, the COVID response um, that the council and partners undertook and the quality of provision on our CQC um, inspection outcomes for the last sort of 12 months really. So the presentation is going to provide an overview of the support of the independent sector during the pandemic and it also provides an update on our current CQC registrations um, and ratings for care provision in Doncaster including care homes, dom care and supported living. Um, I'd like to thank the chair for her comment already on the triangular graphic that was put in there. So um, in terms of some of the overview, particularly around the Omicron variant that we saw um, at the back end of last year and the early part of this year, um, the operational commissioning team have been providing support to the sector for over two years, so throughout COVID from the very start to the very end. And that's involved almost daily contact with most of our commission providers and very regular contact with providers who aren't on our framework. So there's been lots and lots of um, engagement and support gone out to providers within the borough, um, not just through Omicron, but through the whole pandemic process. The supports included telephone calls, information, comms, um, regular support with staff, they've visited where it's been absolutely essential to go and visit and support providers and just generally working with our um, infection prevention control, public health and CCG colleagues, um, there's been a network of support placed around our providers. Through Omicron what we did see was the biggest um, number, the largest number of providers with what we would call COVID exposure. So as you can see, it was quite a high number with 116. And that was almost double what we saw in the first wave of COVID. The good news is that we didn't see the level of serious illness and deaths as a result of Omicron. Um, it, was, it was very much people were quite asymptomatic or the symptoms were very mild and we didn't see the impact in terms of the loss of life that we saw previously. At the peak, we had 40 of our older persons' care homes closed, which is pretty significant because we haven't got many more than that. So at, the, at a point, we, were, um, we had very few beds available in Doncaster at one point. Um, but luckily, partners all rallied around together. The providers have done an amazing job, and we're, we're down into single figures now, which is a much more comfortable place to be and goes back to what Councillor Curran rightly questioned earlier around testing and making sure that our care homes are protected. And that's a priority for all of us as partners in the system to make sure that our most vulnerable are protected in those settings. There was exposure across all of adult social care, so it was really interesting um, in a strange way, the first wave didn't really impact on staffing resource internally. What we did see in, through the Omicron variant was actually for the first time staff within organisations, so across the hospitals, the CCG, the council, all of our providers were um, reporting high, high, high sickness rates for the first time. We were starting to see quite significant numbers of staff um, contracting COVID. Touch wood, that seems to have abated along with the rest of the um, country and the borough's um, test, ra test rates and um, we're in a much better space but it was very different it felt very different in Omicron to that first um, wave of Covid <coughs> and the subsequent second third waves that we had in the Delta variants. We did have one domiciliary care provider out of all of our providers that were not able to cover some calls at the very peak of Omicron we were really fortunate in that we've got some in-house provision through our STEP service and our PSU and our Smile Day centres and we were able to get our staff to help support um, those individuals to make sure that nobody missed their care calls so everybody got their care calls in spite of that one provider really struggling because they had 29 of their staff go off in a week. It, it, it was very difficult but our staff were amazing. Um, they rallied round and supported that, that company and that, those providers to carry on delivering care to people. So um, it just shows you that partnership working was absolutely at the front and it wasn't just statutory partners. I think very often we talk about how ourselves and the CCG and, and housing and statutory partners work together, but actually it was a real partnership work across the system, including providers. We had hospital discharge and MDTs were stepped up again in Omicron to make sure that we were maximising the flow through hospitals, making sure that as many people were being discharged as safely as possible to the right place. 
We had over 30 providers a day at the peak contacting us with advising of outbreaks and staff testing positive. There were twice weekly meetings with our infection prevention control team to discuss testing and closures. And obviously Victor and other colleagues, um, Andrew I know has been really involved in IMT, which was a regular meeting looking at all um, outbreaks across the system. And obviously there was that reduction in domiciliary care packages that I talked about. So I've talked about the daily monitoring of COVID cases that were in place throughout the pandemic and we had daily reporting from our operational commissioning team through to our incident management team, which is IMT, which is the meeting I just mentioned. And that was chaired by Rupert as the Director of Public Health. There was support for providers to access guidance, testing, grant funding, and to ensure that we had ongoing provision and that it remained largely unaffected by the impacts um, to provision of COVID. We had management of outbreaks across adult social care, including closure to admissions, outbreak meetings and additional support and guidance were in place for those two years. So if there was a, a care home or a provider that was closed due to an outbreak, they would have what we called outbreak meetings where you would have the entire multi-agency would wrap around that provider with the owners, with the managers of the home to work with them around how do we manage the outbreak, how do we keep the impact as minimal as possible and actually how do we get people open and operating safely. We had a daily hospital MDT in for hospital discharges that was seven days a week for 18 months um, and that was stepped back up in Omicron as well. So we stepped it down and flexed it back up in terms of the Omicron and that was mainly to manage those admissions into care homes to make sure that they were safe discharges from hospital into the care homes and making sure that they were supported with the appropriate testing and risk management in place. We also offered support to the CCG to find suitable designated settings through our operational commissioning team and we had um, two care homes that were identified and were designated settings throughout the pandemic. One is currently still up and running um, and they were the one that were operated through um, Omicron. We stood the other one down because we didn't actually have, fortunately, we didn't have that many um, COVID positive patients needing nursing home or residential care provision at the point of discharge. There's been access to PPE. We all, none of us knew what PPE was two years ago. We all know what PPE is now. Um, so from the, from the beginning, um, with the operational commissioning team, the national clipper scheme, which people will have heard of at the point of um, sort of spring, summer, la two years ago, I know I said last year, um, was introduced. And all of our providers, including our direct payment recipients, PAs, were able to access PPE through the national clip clipper scheme and through the council. Um, in terms of management and access to the initial COVID vaccination in January 21, um, there was a group of us, of all, el all eligible staff members from across adult social care were offered vaccination. We had um, a really good success rate amongst our care home um, staff sector. So there was three and a half thousand people employed in care homes in Doncaster. And of those, 40 chose not to have the vaccination at the time, which was a really small number. Um, so that was that was really helpful. It was a real partnership effort. We actually had to do manual booking for the first few days. Myself and others were ringing members of staff from across the adult care sector up till seven, half seven at night, trying to make sure that we didn't waste any vaccine, that we maximised the number of people we got through. Luckily, we'd um, managed to become slicker by the time we got the booster programme and we had the central booking system, which was multi-agency. And again, has worked really well. We've had really positive uptake of the booster vaccination. We've had lots of guidance and information, newsletters, comms out to all of our providers um, on a really regular basis. Our comms team have been amazing in supporting us in terms of making sure that we've got regular newsletters that are eye-catching enough for people to want to keep opening them because it was so regular particularly in the early stages with the numerous changes to guidance. We wanted to make sure that, that people didn't get sort of email fatigue, if you like, from all of the guidance and newsletters that were coming out. We had monitoring and uptake of support with providers and we had frequently asked questions, one-to-one -one sessions, particularly around people that were COVID hesitant. I think that's why we were fortunate to have such low numbers compared to other places of staff that didn't have their vaccination in the end. Um, and I think that was partly due to the level of support which the system provided those individuals with. So initially it was um, information and advice. We had frequently asked questions. They could have group sessions. CCG provided clinicians to come and talk to people on a one-to-one -one if they were really concerned. So it was just, it was a real system effort which had a really positive outcome. 
From September to January, as I talked about, we got a little bit slicker in terms of booking people in for the vaccination, and we had a central booking system created, which had staff from the council, the CCG, and other partners in terms of getting people booked onto their vaccination and making sure that we maximised the number of people that we were able to access. There's been £15 million worth of grants administered and managed throughout, the operation, throughout COVID by our operational commissioning team and also our finance team. And all of those have gone to the providers set in, in Doncaster across the borough, commissioned or non-commissioned. All of that money has been invested for those providers. And we've had to do frequent monitoring returns to the DHSC about how our providers have spent that money, how it's reduced the impact of COVID, how we've been able to increase staffing and capacity, et cetera. So that, that's been a huge piece of work. The money has been very welcomed by the sector. Um, I'm quite sure if I had private sector colleagues here, they would say that without it, we, we wouldn't have managed. Um, but it's not to underestimate the amount of administration and um, delivery of, of that grant funding. And then there's, there's also been access to the council's supplier relief fund as well that's been managed through the operational commissioning team for the financial year 2020 to 2021. And again, that was to ensure that providers were able to sustain their operations throughout COVID. So that's kind of the, a very whistle-stop tour of, of a lot of the work that's been done throughout COVID. There's been a huge amount of hard work. I personally would want to say a huge thank you to all of our providers, commissioning and NHS staff, but also to our councillors and the council for investing um, time, money, effort and resource into making sure those providers were able to continue throughout. I'm going to move on to the CQC ratings and registration now. Overall, it's a good news story, particularly given the challenges of the last two years. Um, as you can see, we've increased the number of providers or care homes in Doncaster with a good to outstanding ratio, and that's gone up by 8.1%. So that's a really good news story, given obviously the challenges that providers have been under in the last two years. We've had the number of providers move from inadequate to requires improvement, so that's increased as well. Whilst it's not good or outstanding, which is where we want to be for all of our providers, it certainly shows that providers are on that journey in terms of increasing the quality of care they deliver. And I suppose the best news for me is that we've seen no, no providers in inadequate which is really good for um, any council, any, any system, and we've seen that reduced by 2.5%. So hopefully we can keep that going and we can continue to see more and more providers getting good and outstanding in Doncaster. And there's some of the numbers in terms of the individuals on there that you know, you're more than welcome to go through and, and the breakdown. Domiciliary care and supported living. Again, very similar position. We've got more providers being um, rated as good and outstanding. That's up by 3.8%. 3, 3 Requires improvement is down by 3.8%, um, which is not a bad thing because it means that they've moved to good or outstanding. And again, that position of no providers being inadequate has stayed the same. So I think overall the providers have done an, an amazing job to maintain quality in the last two years given the position um, that they've been in. That's just a kind of summary of the sheet before. So three care homes have closed in Doncaster in the last two years. One closed due to quality issues in July 2020. One was a planned closure due to a new build. And one has closed due to ongoing financial um, viability. We're very fortunate in Doncaster in that the market in our care home provision is quite buoyant. There is lots of capacity. Um, and we need to just be mindful of how we support and monitor that going forward, particularly with the changes to the way people are responding. We're seeing less people wanting to go into care homes and more people wanting to stay in their own communities, which is how it should be in their own homes for longer. So we'll just need to be mindful of, of how, the impact of that in Doncaster and nationally as we go forward. As I've said, the results from CQC have improved across all areas and all four of the previously inadequate in, rated inadequate services, two care homes and two non-contracted domiciliary care have been re-inspected and are either good or have moved to requires improvement. So what's next? It, it, it's, not, it, it's a moving feast, it doesn't stop. So at the moment we're consulting with our providers on a fees and rates consultation and that will be due for implementation in April and that will go through the usual um, council decision making process. 
We're continuing to work with providers on quality improvements with on-site contract visits and support. Now that um, restrictions have been lifted, we can get more, um, for want of a better phrase, boots on the ground and we can start to go and, and really visit places and, and get underneath those um, potential quality issues quickly. We want to build on the existing joint arrangements that we've got with health commissioners to ensure that we've got continued market stability. We want to implement a joint social care and, and health care homes contract, and that's underway now currently. We're going to continue to work with providers, partners, and people with lived experience to develop and implement models of care for future contracts. So our domiciliary care contract is up for renewal next year, and we want to make sure that we've got the best model for um, the borough as we can. And that'll involve a lot of consultation, engagement, um, looking at other places, seeing what works really well, and um, getting rid of what doesn't work well and also the same for our supported living contracts. Some of you might be aware that nationally there is um, a drive to undertake the fair cost of care exercise across every council um, and this is a national requirement for the DHSC and that's for national submission in the autumn of 2022. Um, so every council between now and then will be doing a fair cost of care exercise with its providers um, to make sure that we can meet that submission date in September and we will wait and see what uh, comes out of the DHSC following the national submission of those. And we're going to work with providers and it says DIPS programme, that's our mosaic programme, our, our, our um, integrated provider programme for the provider portal to go live in summer 2022 and I believe there's a testing programme happening today which is really helpful. So um, that will be part and parcel of that delivery. So that's the end of the slideshow. Are there any questions? Thank you so much uh, for going through your slides now with us, Caroline. Really, really informative. Um, one of the questions that I have uh, is um, about the staff. Obviously, everybody across the board has worked incredibly hard under the most um, extenuating circumstances. Um, over the last two to three years, I suppose coming up to three years, when they're already pressured before they got to, the, you know, before COVID happened. And obviously a lot of this is uh, thanks to the amazing skill and dedication of staff across the board here, providers and, the, and the, all the care home staff. Um, we were just wondering what things are in place to help with staff wellbeing and care, because obviously there's gonna be I know that even my own friends that work across the sectors um, are burnt out and the system feels very uh, fragile. And I was just wondering what, um, as a council, that we're um, seeing and supporting in terms of, uh, you know, thinking of the future of the staff wellbeing, but where they are right now. That's a very valid question and something that's on all of our minds really. As you say, staff are tired. We had the floods in Doncaster and then we went straight into COVID. It's been a long time. Um, internally, obviously, we've got counselling services. Myself and um, Phil are very keen, along with Debbie and, and the rest of the leadership team, how do we support frontline staff, making sure that we're engaging with people regularly. I think it's always very difficult. How do you reach that balance? One of the ways that we do that internally is to monitor through Workforce Digest. Um, so we get a report through from HR around tracking sickness, understanding why people are off poorly, making sure return to works are done properly, and that people are getting that support that they need. I think it will also help the fact that staff are able to perhaps come into work more often now and be in the office and get some peer support, which has been available but different because you sat on a screen. So I think that will that certainly would help me personally, and I'm sure that it will help other people. There's the counselling services that are also available as well. Colleagues through the CCG and RDASH have provided specialist support for staff, particularly around trauma experiences or any specialist counselling support that people have needed, obviously through their experiences working through COVID. We've been very fortunate that that's been opened up to our providers. So as I was saying earlier, that wraparound support for care homes where there's been outbreaks or any provider for that matter, um, they've all been offered that additional support if needs be because it's, it was very difficult when they were seeing lots of people um, sadly lose their lives um, during the first, second and third waves in care homes. It was really challenging. So I think as a system, again, everybody's really pulled together to try and support staff. I think as leaders, we need to be mindful about what we ask of people this year because whilst there's a lot of change coming down the road, particularly in adult social care for things like charging reform and 
um, whatever happens with you know the submissions around fair cost of care and it's an ever-changing landscape and I think we just need to be mindful of, of what we're asking staff to do um, and given just the background of where we are so I think it's something we're all really conscious of thank you um, building on from that question I have a question from Councillor Bluff thank you chair um, this concern with the staff drowning in um, the amount of cases they've got and that the daily crises are coming more often um, how are they being supported to get through that and do they feel like they there is you know an, an end to it that they can come out the other side it feels ever so strange because I need to talk into this, but you're over there. Um, completely agree. I think there is a huge amount of demand coming through everybody's front door, whether it's ours, whether it's the CCGs, whether it's primary care, the hospital, everywhere. You know, we're seeing we're seeing that increase in demand. And what we're trying to do in the council currently is there's a piece of work we're looking at innovation sites in adult care, looking at how we manage our front door better, how we engage with people. So we've got um, people with lived experience as part of those working groups and those innovation sites saying that works for us, that doesn't work for us, how can we do things slightly differently? I think in terms of the capacity within the teams, what we're trying to do is access additional capacity. So we've been fortunate that we've had a transformation pot of money that we've been able to access in terms of getting an additional temporary capacity to go through some of the cases that perhaps haven't been a priority through COVID that we now need to address um, and get back to business as usual. I would say that staff still feel under pressure um, I think it's about how we engage with staff on a on a one-to-one on -one basis as a team, how I engage with my leaders and, and my team managers and how they engage with their staff. And I think it's also about how we engage with the unions and the discussions that we have with JCC. We meet, we meet with the unions on a regular basis as well. So I think it's about making sure that that communication is open. And again, I think it is about that just being mindful, A, the impact of the last two and a half, three years, and also what we do going forward and, and maybe we just need a bit of um, stability and consolidation while we catch our breath before we start to run for the next thing so hopefully touch wood um, things outside of our control will enable us to do that thank you also is it taking longer to be able to get things like medications and support for mental health that sort of thing so I, I might go to Andrew around medication, not that I'm aware of, so I've certainly not had any um, escalations to me around medication as far as I know, um, that's um, okay, but I'll let Andrew comment on that. In terms of accessing mental health support and any support taking longer, I think there are challenges in pockets, so I think that some areas are seeing pressure more than others, so I think we've got some pressure around occupational therapy. Um, and when I say we, I mean the system. Um, I think we know that, that we need to start to look at, we're looking at as a system, how do we work better together, reduce duplication, um, and make sure that we're targeting our resources as efficiently as possible. And I think the lifting of restrictions will help with some of that. So in terms of the mental health support, there are pressures around mental health, Andrew will be able to comment on those as well at the very acute end. Um, but I'm not so I'm not seeing that challenge at the front end necessarily. I think the acute end of mental health is is perhaps feeling the pressure more than the the prevention end. I don't know whether there's anything you want to add there, Andrew. Uh, thank you. I think certainly the medication there shouldn't be an issue around um, issuing the medication um, through the COVID period. There's obviously sticky areas around that around repeat prescriptions and 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 availability of staff for prescriptions and community pharmacists but as a whole there's no uh, challenge around um, availability of medication um, and um, there are occasional times when certain types of medication become unavailable for a whole variety of logistical reasons um, and you know those are things that we've monitored consistently really um, certainly post Brexit as well you know around that but the, there are usually a, a ways around that and work around that so it, it isn't an issue in terms of the mental health service, um, it, it's under the same pressure that the whole of the health service is under. Um, and yeah, the, the, the pandemic has um, seen a, a, an increased uh, number of people um, requiring support for mental health services. So that is, uh, you know, the pressures are there um, as they are in primary care and uh, physical secondary health care. 
Um, as a CCG, we continue to work with uh, Mardash and other providers, really, to, to you know, look at what the offer is and to prioritise that and uh, try and, and make sure we've got accessible early help, really, in terms of improving access to psychological therapies, the IAP services, um, and we've introduced um, um, online uh, digital offers around that as well as face-to-face. -face. So it, it is a constant conversation um, across providers trying to make sure we've got um, uh, good access but there are pressures. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bluff. Um, I've got a question which is, um, what learning have you taken from this time and are gonna continue to use across the sector? I did notice you talked a lot about how we did, you put in seven day uh, MDT services so you, it was faster discharge with the right things but it's stepped down so it's like less than seven days um, and then also an, a question on top of that is how do we see the integrated care board or system um, helping with maintaining or growing part of these positive results yes so for reassurance we do still have a seven day service so um, we do still have staff seven days at the hospital. What the MDT was, was an additional commissioning layer. So um, we always have frontline staff seven days at the hospital working on discharges. What the MDT was, was commissioners from the CCG and commissioning from um, adult care who normally would not operate on a seven day basis, but they were just there to oversee. That can be stepped up and flexed as and when we need to. Um, we will absolutely be looking towards increasing and growing seven day services um, across health and care um, as the demand warrants it. So I think one of the things that I've taken from the learning in the main is how we can continue to work together as a partnership and pull together because what I've seen, it's difficult for me because I've only been in Doncaster since the pandemic started. So I don't know what it was like before. So, um, but from my point of view, what I've taken is, what, or what I've seen in Doncaster is when times are tough and people's backs are against the wall, partners do rally round and the relationships there enable us to overcome any barriers to make sure that people are getting the support that they need in the main. Um, so I'd like that to continue. I wouldn't want that to change, but I don't know whether that was there before. Um, I think the other thing for me that I've learned is um, sometimes managers need to get out of the way. So I think our frontline staff, whether it's internal or providers, um, frontline staff have seen us through the pandemic locally and nationally. And there's something for us about, I think, getting out of the way a bit and letting staff do what they need to do. I think also there's something around how, I think what's coming out really strongly is the voice of people. So co-production is something that we're really keen to grow and develop um, within Doncaster and use people with lived experience in terms of how do we develop services going forward. And I think that will continue to be really integral. Um, and I think the main thing for me is around flexibility and resilience. I think it's shown everybody how resilient and flexible the system has been and has had to be. Um, I think it's just how we make sure that we don't flex it to the point that, that it breaks. Um, it will be the challenge. How the ICS, ICB will bring and grow that together. Um, I'm sure Andrew will have a view on this as well. My hope is that we will start to see a more place devolved budget that's my understanding of the direction of travel, unless it's changed, because it is an ever-changing feast. Um, I'd like to see Doncaster have a loud voice at the table um, and to make sure that we're accessing the budget and the um, resources that Doncaster needs to continue to build and grow um, where, it, where it has been for the last two years, really. So I would like to see that element of on-the-ground place-based commissioning um, I think we, we desperately need that. I think at the same time, there'll be benefits to be reaped as well from some of the economies of scale around the real specialist end of commissioning and what that starts to look like around sort of transforming care, very high end complex cases. How can we actually use, spread that resource across the, 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 the place with a capital P um, across the region, perhaps better than we do now. Um, 
I think it will be an interesting time and a bit of suck it and see after July. I don't know what Andrew's view is. Um, I think you've touched on what I would have talked about really in terms of system approach. Um, as things emerge around the, the ICB, the ICS, um, the partnership, I think we'll, we'll increasingly see um, place being really important, but system being important as well. So some of those areas you've mentioned there, uh, Carolyn, around uh, you, you know some of the um, small numbers, but highly important um, services that we need to provide can maybe be better done across the system. Uh, on a larger system rather than an individual town um, across South Yorkshire. Um, but th as well, the question around learning and, and, and what we understand and how we evaluate as well. We, we've obviously had a response across four towns ac ac across Doncaster, uh, across South Yorkshire. So there is something around the, the evaluation of what worked well, what didn't work well, and how we level up. Um, we, we're keen when we move in towards any of this that, that, that we don't just homogenise and we don't level down, we level up. Um, and look at what works best across our South Yorkshire patch and learn from that. So I think those are some of the exciting bits around the development of the, uh, of the ICS and, the, uh, and moving towards an ICB footing. Um, but but it will bring its challenges as well, because um, obviously that brings pressures to towns that need to level up. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I just have a comment, but before I say that, um, does anybody in the panel have any extra questions? Brilliant. Um, Caroline, I was wondering um, if you could bring to the panel a later date, uh, I think we'd love to hear uh, about your future consultation, about the new contracts and, uh, and uh, all, the, all the stuff from that, whether that's when you're going through it or after you've finished uh, the consultation, that would be really something that we'd like to hear about. Yeah, no, definitely. More than happy to bring that. More than happy to bring both. I think for the new contracts going forward, it'd be really helpful if um, we could come back for comment yeah. before we take it any further. So, yeah, happy to do that and put that in the diary, not a problem. That'd be great, yeah, because I think as a panel, we often talk about how... Um, you know, as councillors, we get a lot of data about social care because we get a lot of casework about social care. Um, so uh, it'd be nice to be able to have a look. I get emails from all of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to put a face to a name. Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today. No, thank you for your time. Thank you. I guess I can't turn it off now. It really doesn't like me. I'll leave it on. I'll leave it on. Yeah. That was brilliant. Thank you, uh, Caroline. And uh, as always, brilliant presentation. And I like the triangles, like I said. Uh, but <laughs> sucker for a bit of a, a nice design or something different. <laughs> Just be triangles next time. <laughs> Um, our next uh, agenda item is number seven, which is by uh, Andrew Russell, who's a um, chief nurse from Doncaster Clinical Commissioning Group. He's going to talk about the uh, care quality commissioning, which is the CQC in NHS settings. And just a reminder for the recording, if anybody watches this, the ICS or the ICB is the Integrated Care System or Board. We don't have contact. NHS, I've got that magic touch. A double, double up as IT support in my spare time. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> thank you, Chair, and thank you for the invite, really. And um, just by way of introduction, um, I'm Andrew Russell, Chief Nurse at the CCG, which is a clinical commissioning group. I've been in Doncaster 
best part of 12 years. I came for two years and, and never left. Um, and I'm and, and not intending to. So um, um, originally from Wakefield, um, trained, it, trained in Leeds, but I came to Doncaster and stayed. Um, I had a, 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 a conversation with Councillor Smith just around um, the presentation, really, and um, we could have replicated what has done around some of the CQC registrations around health provision. Um, and, and we can touch on that in the questioning, but I haven't put that in my slides. What I'll put in my slide pack and what I'll talk to is really just around quality assurance. And we, we have got this um, huge re, yeah, re architecture, really, of the NHS that's, that's underway. Um, and um, assuming it works its way through um, Parliament, that will be enacted on the 1st of July. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful just to talk about quality, quality surveillance, quality improvement, um, quality assurance, what we do around that. Um, some of this is totally interdependent with local authority services, but um, give you a flavour of how we're transforming those and how we're transitioning those into new organisations, because what we're really keen is that um, we, we reap the benefits of the re-architecture of, uh, of the NHS systems and nothing drops through cracks and nothing gets lost in what we're doing and um, some of the great work that's happened across our towns and particularly in Doncaster that none of that's lost. Um, so it's full of acronyms. I'll apologise, I'll try and cover those off, stop me if there's anything in there but but you, you know, this is the NHS and we love an acronym and even I don't understand them all sometimes. And we have repeated ones that um, mean different things. But if there's anything I don't mention, please stop me. OK, busy slide. I'm not going to go through it all. But I think we, we are changing from a, a, a CCG-based um, commissioning um, system. So clinical commissioning groups um, exist across um, uh, uh, geographical areas in South Yorkshire and Bassetlaw. We've had five of those um, and those have um, largely been coterminous with the local authorities in those um, five areas. So we've had Sheffield, Rotherham, Barnsley, Doncaster and Bassetlaw um, uh, uh, that have been in place for a number of years since 2013 since um, primary care trusts ended and we moved towards clinical commissioning groups which were um, um, lots of reasons why the, those were brought in but to ensure that we had a real clinical focus on the commissioning of care um, that uh, you know, it was believed that, that clinicians sat at the heart of what we did and were the most closest to our, our patients uh, and, and our communities, so they could bring that that you know that um, knowledge and experience to the fore to ensure we were commissioning the right services. What's happening now is uh, that you, you'll understand is that um, um, once the bill goes through, um, the CCG ceases to exist, um, and we move towards a, 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 an ICS. Uh, model, which is integrated care system um, model. Now, the, the system is South Yorkshire. Um, the footprint's changing slightly, and the Bassett Law part is moving into uh, Nottinghamshire. Um, so, as that, that we've come earlier, South Yorkshire um, uh, uh, footprint. Now, the ICB, Integrated Care Board, will be, be the statutory place. So, the CCG stop, the ICB starts. So, that takes on all the statutory responsibilities, powers and duties that the CCGs did have and will now have at a board level. So that's an NHS-led, with partners, um, place where all the statutory duties for commissioning exist. Sitting alongside that, and we'll touch on that later on, a, a different thing like the ICP, the partnership, which obviously brings in local authority and a, a real wide range of partners that sit alongside the statutory board and to help guide, support, as we do now. So this is just what's happening now. So these are the transition arrangements. So um, right down at the bottom, you'll see due diligence, and due diligence is just what the government are telling us we have to measure, we have to sign off, we have to do on the by the 1st of July to transition things safely. Um, but we've got a raft of work groups. So all those bottom HR and people, corporate functions, finance assets, clinical quality, digital and BI, these are all the big, big, um, areas, the umbrella terms that we've got of, of areas that we need to transition. Because what we want to do is land safely on the 1st of July uh, with all these so everything can continue and nothing drops through. We've got work stream groups, we've got a board, and we've ultimately got a joint committee. So JC, CCG, Joint Committee of CCGs. That's all that stands for. So that's where our leaders, our decision makers, those with authority, sit together in a joint committee 
to, to sign things off and understand the governance around this. So you can see it uh, looks complicated, but if, what I'm trying to show is that there's some governance in place around this transition that's at system level that's across South Yorkshire. Obviously, for the purposes of this, clinical quality and patient safety. Um, and, yeah, and, and that's at the heart of my, my role, my job, um, and I chair the group that sits across South Yorkshire that's undertaking this work um, to do this. Um, but everything around this is some interdependencies around this. So whatever we do, you know, it's a complex world that we live in. So my work streams around clinical quality and patient safety rely on having good business intelligence, good digital solutions, um, and good data. They also rely on HR, people, corporate policies, procedures. It's all interdependent. So we're working really closely together to do that. This slide just tries to give you a grasp, really, of the, of the scope of the transition work. Um, we've tried to, and in, in each one of these, underneath every one of these titles, there's another set of bullet points. But these are the these are the range of stuff that. Um, um, I, as chief nurse, are responsible for it within the CCG and the board is as a unitary board. But there's a, the, my colleagues across the South Yorkshire patch all have this in. So this is a common, common roles that sit within chief nurse teams, um, and it, it, it's broad and it, it's broad and varied as you can as you can see. Um, I think it's all quality. So it you know, every bit of this it helps us understand and drives forward quality for our communities um, you know, in its broadest sense. Um, but there is this bit around that we've been asked to talk today just around what's quality surveillance, quality assurance, quality improvement. Um, so current ar uh, um, arrangements are in place. So we've been in, in place, as we said, from 2013. So we have really well-established routes by which we understand quality within the provide provision um, be that be that within um, um, CQC regulated um, social care or in healthcare and you know they're very similar uh, ways that we monitor that and we base quality just on on what we call the Darcy triangle so Lord Darcy back in 2008 um, described quality as a triangle so it's around what's clinically effective um, what's safe and what the experience of the individual patient and user is of that service. So those are the three domains by which we, 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 we monitor quality. And each organisation has a duty and responsibility to monitor that quality themselves. So they're commissioned to provide service that is of high quality and they have internal systems that, 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 we, that they have to understand and take to their governance structures to understand that. Our job is to be a challenge to that to oversee that, to assure ourselves that that's happening, um, to critique that where necessary, and to support that um, wherever possible, and have that extra layer of assurance that we've had a, a, another pair of eyes look at the, the data that we've seen through around effectiveness, around safety, and around the experience that, uh, of what people are doing. So we, we need to make sure we've got systems in place, and we do, that, that are sensitive enough to do that, that then we can analyze that data. And then most importantly, what do we do with that? You know, we have to understand what that means in terms of improving quality within services, but also how we commission things better in the future. So not only making sure what we've got is of high quality, but what we might get in the future and what we might need in the future is, is, is sensitive to what we're hearing is needed. And, and uh, So we do that. And then we've also got um, an, uh, the quality surveillance group, QSG, it's a, you may have heard of QSG, Quality Surveillance Group, is a, a, a what's currently in place at system level to bring together lots of providers, lots of, um, a, of, of stakeholders. So we've got an evolving structure at place as well. So as we move towards a, an, an integrated care system, um, we'll need to change how we do things because we'll have one board now that becomes responsible for all of South Yorkshire in terms of the statutory requirements. So you can see that's a significant change to what we currently have. So my governing body as a unitary body sits and has that statutory responsibility, whereas that will switch to one board across South Yorkshire. 
Um, so what we're developing and ensuring is that we've got clear lines of sight to that board. Um, and things aren't going to change overnight on the 1st of July, and we've got to continue doing what we're doing. But there will be an executive team, a board of 20, who as a unitary board will be responsible for, for uh, ensuring all this and have that accountability. So what we're developing is, is making sure that they can um, have clear lines of sight on things like statutory duties, and there are many and varied statutory duties, that we understand the um, emerging threats and risks to quality, um, yeah, and the COVID pandemic has been a, a clear example of when we've really had to understand rising risks and threats, and that showing that we've got um, the ability for the system to respond and for the system to ensure that quality improvements are in place. So these are just my thoughts. We've got a team in place. Last week they announced the um, leadership, some of the main leadership um, executives have been appointed. So we've got a new uh, Chief Nursing Officer for South Yorkshire will have a Medical Director for South Yorkshire. It will fall within the scope of those two job descriptions to, to hold the ring on this. Um, but uh, yeah, I, and, and the architecture and the hard wiring and what this looks like will start to emerge over a couple of months. This is just my view of what I, I can't imagine it will be much different to this. But we will see a place at the, across South Yorkshire where there's the deeper analysis around quality. So uh, uh, a system quality group, quality and patient safety group, whatever you may want to call it, that will sit at the ICB. But it will be drawn from everything that's happening in place. So at the moment, we're not envisaging dismantling the quality structures that we've got at place currently. Those would continue, and we'd continue to have a real clear grip on what's happening within the quality of services within Doncaster as a place, as will Sheffield, Rotherham, Barnsley, um, and to a certain extent, Bassett Law, because Bassett Law, although they were they move into Nottinghamshire, will still have a real need to understand the quality of care that's, at, for instance, happening within the hospital or children's hospital in Sheffield. Patients will... Patients don't sit within geographical boundaries, they move across boundaries into different services. So Bassett Law continues to be a key partner around understanding quality. The other major change as well that we've got, um, um, which is something that has to change by the 1st of July, um, is that the, the um, quality surveillance group, as is, is a NHS England, NHS EI requirement that came in in 2013 that they had to host and manage a quality surveillance group, which was on a much bigger footprint, um, that came on the back of a, a, a number of, um, a, of health scandals, really, that, that recognised that if we had a more joined up approach to quality and understanding of risk, we might be able to respond to emerging threats and, uh, around risk in a much quicker way. So quality surveillance groups include health partners, local authorities, health education England, um, um, health watch um, uh, and the, the list can go on really in terms of public health um, and there is no defined definitive list it can include a, a, a large number of partners that can all bring the intelligence and, and understanding some of that is hard intelligence some of it's more softer intelligence and experience and data can bring it to the table so if we're talking about a single provider you have a richer, more broader sense of the quality and of what's happening within that provider. And it's ho it was hoped that through there, you had a much more sensitive way uh, of, of, of understanding when things weren't happening well or when things were happening well and you could replicate them and share them and learn from them. So that ends um, on the 1st of July and that requirement for NHS England to do that stops and it's been replaced by a system quality board. Um, so the System Quality Board will sit at a footprint of the South Yorkshire footprint. So this is us as partners working together. Um, and the guidance is out there, and it, it, it sounds fairly similar to a, 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 in its aspirations around a quality surveillance group. Um, and we're just in the process of starting to develop what that looks like. Who are the key partners? Who needs to be sat around that table? What is the agenda? What are the metrics we'll use? What will we, what will we measure? How will we bring intelligence to that meeting um, to, to make that really useful and adding value to the system and helping us support um, providers of care to improve and understanding when there, there might be areas that aren't de delivering the care that we might want and, 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 and want. So, and it's going to sit aside. So it's not the quality committee. It's not the, the, the ICBs, but it's not the NHS's quality committee. 
um, it will sit aside to that and have a more strategic view on quality and have that, that range of partners. Uh, and really hearing patients, um, and forgive me for saying patients, I've been steeped in NHS for too long, um, but hearing that voice, what, what, what are the services really like and how are we understanding the experience that people are, are having when they're accessing services? So this, moving towards some of the, the last slides really. So this is just a bit more to, to add that in a diagrammatic form. So we've got an ICP, so Integrated Care Partnership, which will sit alongside the ICB as the statutory group. And again, that, that is starting to form in terms of who and how that is. So that's got a much wider partnership. Um, and that will sit alongside the, the, the board as a, as a statutory function. Um, and the System Quality Board and, and the ICB Quality Committee, or however it's, you know, and these are just my words, it will emerge um, as that wiring and that, that, that starts to take place, will we'll form part of the understanding of quality and how we discuss it and, and, and how we move that forward. So, a huge amount of work to do by all the teams. So, you saw that long list of duties, uh, and, and all my team are involved in every bit of those. So, they're all sitting as little subgroups and working with colleagues across South Yorkshire to try and, and design the, certainly land for safety on the 1st of July, but then the design phase really gets underway at that stage. And we, we continue to look at, at how we. Um, take the, the, you know, the benefits of working at system level. So design isn't going to happen by the 1st of July. It's going to, going to be something that's iterative, that takes some time, that we've got some strategic plans around how we understand all of those work streams at a system level and move them forward. Some of those will be high priority. Some of them will be uh, longer priorities that take a period of time to develop. Um, but things like you know, continuing healthcare, we might say that that still needs to be delivered very locally because we work closely with the local authority, we work closely with the providers of, of services for people with continuing healthcare. Yet there might be some real advantages around setting of standards and policy, understanding we've got the right workforce and training that really lends itself to a system working. But then the delivery needs to be Doncaster focused or, or Rotherham or Barnsley or Sheffield because everybody works slightly differently in how they deliver that and how they work in local partnerships. Safeguarding is another real example. We've got, we, you know, we all work to the same statutory requirements, we all work to the same guidance, and, and we all try and aspire to the same outcomes. However, how we do that in our partnerships and our statutory boards differs from town to town, and each town has its own challenges around different um, concerns around safeguarding. So that we have to remain with that real local focus um, and, and make sure that we're delivering for Doncaster people and it won't be a one-size-fits-all for everybody across our, our, our uh, patch of South Yorkshire. Just as we know it's not one fit for Doncaster, we have different wards, different, different challenges and different localities which require different support and, 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 and um, um, services that are put in place. So everything we're doing is, is trying to maintain that, that local feel and, and, and recognising that Doncaster as a place remains has primacy over system, um, and that's the that's the, that's the discussion that's happening uh, across South Yorkshire, and, and you know having a proper split where place it remains important uh, and, and, and takes primacy, and so we continue to do the, the integral work that we're doing here and the developments that are happening in Doncaster. I'll stop there. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. Um, and it, it's so, so useful for us because obviously this is going to become the new structure in which we will be looking at everything through scrutiny over the next three, four years uh, onwards. Um, so to be able to try and unpick it, because obviously it's still, it just seems to be still in process every time we come back. So obviously it's been, it was supposed to come in in April and now it's in July, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, and stuff like that. And um, your slides were really, uh, really quite clear as well for us. So thank you so much. Uh, also, I'm a, a Leeds uh, qualified uh, healthcare professional, the Leeds way. Um, from. So um, I've got a question uh, first uh, that just kind of came out from 
um, just the discussion about quality in place. And I think it's a concern that we have as a panel and we've discussed uh, like the integrated care system on board and you might not have an answer for it because it's obviously still um, getting, um, still evolving. But I think we are all quite concerned that, you know, the localities model, which Doncaster and our partners work really well to and are designing even better so that they, we have much better interconnected partnership working. It seems like there's less people to translate their findings into the, into the way that the board would, uh, seems to, to work. And I was just wondering if one of, you know, if that's how some of the quality systems that you guys will be designing helps to make sure that translates. Are you mean to just in terms of the, the capacity to, to, to make that happen or, or are we getting pulled more to system and away from locality? Um, so 1st of July, and, and we, we talk about 1st of July as if it's a, a given, um, it's still at report stage in, in, in through, the, through, you know, through, the, you know, through the parliamentary system, um, but every indication unless parliamentary time gets diverted elsewhere, which it could, I guess, at, at current time, it will be 1st of July. Um, and they talk about lift and shift. So the team that I've got, the team that are currently within the CCG and work within Doncaster as a, as a place, uh, just lift and shift and move on the 1st of July um, and become ICB um, employees, but remain in Doncaster. Um, so the capacity shouldn't change. Um, and I suppose it's how we use that effectively both to support the system level conversations, but have a real focus here. Um, and everything continues. So you'll you'll hear consistently. You know we we you know we're, we're about to continue with this year, the the plans for next year for the life stages, and that continued work that we do jointly between the local authority and CCG and the wider partnership. Um, that's just continuing. Um, you know, and we're not envisaging that will change. Um, some of the 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 work will depend on what, how things are delegated. So the ICB will need to make some decisions about what it holds itself and what it delegates to place and how it delegates that to place and what model. So I think some of that isn't clear yet. Um, but again, the, the, the conversations are around significant levels of, of allowing place to get on with what place gets on with um, and not holding it all at a system level. Um, and, the, and the system, the IC, being a smaller organisation than the place organisations, even though we're all working for the same, same organisation as it were, but we'd be devolved back out into place. So, yeah, I'm hopeful that um, our, what, what we're trying to design is, is a system that doesn't lose any of its capacity or capability to monitor quality and to support quality improvement, because that's the so what at the end of the day. You know, we need to recognise when things aren't of high quality, but we, the so what is how do we make sure we've got quality improvement and how do we work with uh, our providers of healthcare on that quality improvement model and what do we need to do and how do we support um, all provision to become better and, you know, and meet the needs of our population. So I'm hopeful we don't lose any of that and uh, you know, I, I'm strongly advocating we don't. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, that's... Yeah, you know, just being able to try to hold that um, it is great. Thank you. Um, does any of the panel have any questions? Council Corrin. Thank you. Um, just, just trying to follow it, because it looks a bit, there's quite a lot here, isn't there? You know your HR people and your corporate functions. Well, those five, they're the headings of where, uh, where you start. And what comes underneath them? Would it be the these like children in care and everything? It will fit into one of those boxes. No, they're all in quality. They're all in quality. They're in quality. So what I've tried to describe there is who's leading on on the on those particular areas. So so my team yeah. cover off the CCG responsibilities in all of those areas. So so I'm responsible for all of those sitting the, at, at my board, right. but. There's obviously a policy that, so for instance, if we took CHC, my team deliver on CHC, and we have a clinical team that does CHC, but there's a, a, a corporate, there's a policy that covers CHC. So the, the corporate 
is trying to recognise that the corporate team would want to understand what policies are in place across the five CC CCGs and how we move towards a single policy because we're a single organisation. So each, each of those groups has a work plan to try and work through, but there are an interdependency across them all. They're not set in a separate work streams. We all sit a group and say who's doing what and who's yeah. taking ownership of what bit of development. So it seems very similar to before the CCC came in and it turning back to that and the due diligence. Yeah. Is that running through everything? So there's a there's a the due diligence checklist. There's yeah. a checklist and that's a national published checklist of a load of questions and things that have to be done by the 1st of July and handed over. So it might be, how many of this have you got going? How many of that have you got going? Who's doing this? Who's doing that? So we have to sign each bit of that off and there's um, hundreds of items on that due diligence checklist. Yeah. Um, so we have to provide assurance to, um, so, so at the end of the CCG, as it comes to close down, our governing body will have to sign off that they're assured that we've completed that due diligence um, and that will be signed off in preparation for the ICB to start its duties on the 1st of July. So, so that will go through our governing body uh, and, there's got, and we've got a, um, a work stream around that so we meet on a weekly basis around that, uh, understand where we are because we, we're doing the progress of that and making sure we've got everything in place and again that's, that's to make sure that wherever possible nothing's lost. Yeah, so, so it might over to absolutely so, so yeah. for instance if we've got um, an ongoing um, safeguarding review that's happening in Doncaster have, have we recognised that and are we handing that over to the ICB in a safe and effective way so they know it's happening in Doncaster as well so it, get lost. So it, got, so it doesn't get lost so that's the due diligence checklist and we've added to that, um, because of my work streams, there's things that I don't think are on the due diligence checklist that would be helpful to have on. So we're designing, making sure we've, we've captured all of our work so nothing gets lost. Um, and we, we, we're working, so on Friday we've got a, um, a, a two hours with all the teams that are involved with um, patient and quality and, and, and safety. Um, there's 208 people joining a call and we're going to go through that and say, have we missed anything? So we're co-producing this with all the staff at all levels as well, saying, have we missed anything? Is everything that you do that's important to our communities, is it on this list and have we captured it? Um, and, and we'll continue to do that work as well as we move forward. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's just it's, it's, a bit complicated. In it's incredibly complicated and, and I've tried to simplify yeah. it as much as I can, but I recognise it, it's... Um, you know, the, the CCG and the, the health system is a complex infrastructure, um, and this is a complex change. In, 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 it, in its ethos, it's simple. We do five into one and look at system approaches and get the benefits out of that. But to make sure it's done safely is the complex bit, and um, it, it is where the hard work is to make sure we do that safely and we don't lose anything, and then we can reach for the benefits and the, the, you know, the, 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 the opportunities that that system that way of thinking gives us. Can, can I ask you another, another question? It's yeah. just getting a bit complicated. I'm trying to get a bit quality. Uh, so everything comes over and it comes over with due diligence so the work has been done. Yeah. Um, and you're setting up the board of quality surveillance group. Right, so the... Will that be like a scrutiny group or will that be to bring things to the, the new group? So we... And just, just bear in mind what I said, those, those are my thoughts around how the system will look. Yeah, I know We've got great. a leader in place that, that's, in place yet yet. To take, that's, that's yet to take up post and she may have really different views. Yeah. Um, but I, mine aren't, aren't out with the guidance, so, so it won't be radically different. But we'll, we'll, the CCG currently has a Quality and Patient Safety Committee. Yeah. So that is, um, and, and that's been happening this morning. So all of my team contribute to that and the CCG um, looks for assurance around all its provision. So it's a three hour meeting where we look at incredibly uh, detailed evidence around the quality and safety of our provision across all of our, our commission services. Um, be they in care homes, be they in the acute trust, be they in mental health services, community, whatever, whatever we commission services from, we understand 
based on that, you, that triangle, I, I describe what the, what the quality is and where the concerns are. And we do that in very much in, in real detail. We analyze that and we then make recommendations about what additional actions we might need to take if, if there are rising threats or risks. Um, or we provide assurance to the governing body, which has the responsibility that we think it's okay. Or where it isn't okay, what are we doing about it? So, and, and that will have to take place in some form for the ICB, because the ICB mm -hmm. will need to understand that. The system quality board, which will sit alongside that, um, is the much wider partnership. So the local authority, public health, health education, um, health watch, will all have a seat around that table and many others. And they will bring their experience about individual providers and concerns to that table and where there's good practice, where there's good experience, where there's not so good experience to have a much wider, richer conversation where, where we add up all our, all our knowledge, all our intelligence that we bring more in from, from across the board. And that's what we're in the process of setting up, which will replace the QSG, Quality Surveillance Group. Can I ask? Sorry, I'm checking. Sorry, is this all right, Sue? So? Uh, yeah. Sorry. sorry. Uh, Oh no. Thank you. Um, at the top of all these, you've got um, the audit committee. Is there going to be an audit review to make sure everything has been transferred across? And it, will this then, if there is, is it going to be just internal or are you going to have external audit come in to sort it? And who are the external auditors for it, please? Yep, yeah, so um, we have our internal audit committee, um, which um, will, and we're meeting with them on a regular basis now, and, the, and our audit committee involves governing body members um, and our lay membership. Um, so it, it's not the um, executive team, it's the lay members that, that hold us to account um, through our audit committee around due diligence. So it'll have to go there as well, and it's fully included. Um, there is a, a, an, an emerging audit committee for the ICB, which will obviously have to have an audit committee and will draw its membership from lay membership. And we have um, um, 360, which is our external audit um, um, partner. Um, and they're undertaking some external audit on that. Um, we, we call it internal audit. It's one of those strange ones. It's our internal audit company. Um, but they are external uh, and independent who we've commissioned to do that piece of work and they're involved through that due diligence and the transition work. So they're providing some audit function for that and recommendations and reports into, into the transition working groups to do that, to, to hold us account. Will 360 continue being the external auditors once um, it's all transitioned then, or will it change? I don't know the answer to that, because I guess we commission that external audit function and I guess the, the ICB may want to reevaluate who is the external auditors but there, will, there is always a need for internal audit um, in, within that function and to be, to, you know, to be independent um, and then of course there's audit functions around things like end of year accounts and things where we have things like KPMG and we have to you know, independent C individual CCGs have had individual auditors come and audit um, uh, our annual accounts and things so that will have to continue as well. Um, but the, the, the internal audit is more of a, a formative process to give us a, a fresh pair of eyes and give us that view on our work and to challenge us and to scrutinise that, whereas obviously there's a statutory requirement for things like KPMG for the annual accounts, which will continue, and, and who that may be, I'm saying KPMG could be any, any of the accredited um, uh, audit companies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bluff. Uh, Councillor Corrin, would you like to ask a question? It was, it was oh, brilliant. Um, can I just ask, if the government uh, you put your <laughs> mic on, sorry. Is the government giving you extra money for this? More funding to uh, bring in a new system? Because our, our new systems become expensive eventually. The allocation, the allocation to the health service is, is, is what it is. So, you know, we, we, we're in that process of um, ongoing allocation. So there is a view that some of this could be more efficient um, in, in terms of where we do things once um, rather than across the board. Um, 
So the funding takes into account the transition into the new services, and there's not a, uh, I'm not aware of a specific pot just for transition. Um, you know, the, the teams that are currently working and, and are in place will be doing the transition into those new systems. Um, Andrew, when the when there is that transition, so does your role stay the same under a different name? So do, are you part of the system quality board? Are you the representative or? I don't know. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a simple answer. Um, as I say, we 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 understand that we you know, I, I seek to become chief nurse on that first of July because that 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 responsibility, that accountability switches to the newly appointed. Chief Nursing Officer for South Yorkshire. Um, so that ceases. What we have talked about over the last 18 months, really, uh, approaching this is the need for uh, senior nurse leadership around quality and patient safety to remain in place. Um, and that's certainly the, the model that we're working towards. Um, how that works out will be dependent on the, the, the nurse as she comes in, into post. And, um, you know, she'll, she'll uh, have the responsibility to design a system that um, provides her with the right support and assurance to deliver that at place and understand those statutory duties. So I'm not going anywhere um, that I'm aware of, but the, the, the actual detail of how that works will emerge uh, as we move forward. Brilliant. And um, just to clarify, um, sorry if it's uh, not a very good question, but everything because obviously you're in charge you oversee quite a lot that goes into the next all of that goes into the system quality board the system quality board agenda and what it looks at i guess is still open for for discussion um and emerging it, the quality system for the board will incorporate all of that because those are statutory duties and, and, and really key areas of work. So none of that will be lost. And um, we all, all five CCGs measure that and understand that and action that within their own towns. We might do it slightly differently how we measure it and how we report it, but it's all there. And we're replicating that and saying, how do we amalgamate everything that we're understanding at place, distill it down to what's important for a system to allow the system to do what it, it needs to do, whilst allowing place to continue using that data and intelligence locally. So none of that should be lost, and it will all and all those are duties and responsibilities that the ICB will have. Um, you know, they, they, they basically moved the vast majority, it was just a lift and shift from CCG to ICB. The system quality board, I think, needs to be something different it can't just replicate what's happening in a committee of the of the board. It has to be a, a more rounded, richer conversation, more, potentially more strategic rather than responsive to individual quality concerns. It needs to be a bit more strategic around how we as a system and how we as partners understand and drive forward quality improvements. Um, so it, it wouldn't necessarily have replicate all that data and that intelligence. It needs to have a different... A, a different emphasis, I think, for it to add additional value. I absolutely agree with that. Um, that was kind of going to be one of my next questions, which is obviously right now in the way that the CCG works, you guys do that work there, but you all work together and it's very much Doncaster, so you only have to think about that. I'm just wondering how that rich data there then gets translated into mm -hmm. the board that's then you know four or five other also quality places ab yeah ab absolutely and that's what we that's what we're trying to design now um, and uh, you know there's something around what needs to go because we can't replicate everything at the at, at south yorkshire basis else you'd be sat for our days and days looking at quality data so we've got to recognize and work out and be sensitive enough to escalate things that are of are necessary to escalate and and provide assurance the necessary level of assurance to that board um, whilst um, having the permission from that board to undertake that at a local level um, and I think that's how we'll be describing it how much remains 
um, within the control of the system at, at, at place and then understanding how we uh, provide assurance upwards into the into the board level. I think it, 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 it's iterative. Um, we started on that process and, and Gavin Boyles, the um, accountable officer, chief executive of the, of the um, ICB, he's in post now and that's the, and now the executive team are starting to form and his main team are starting to form. That's the next big piece of work is to try and, as he's described it, the wiring diagram. How do we wire it all together now and, and over the next couple of months, um, really understand the form um, and, and you know we understand what the function might do, but understand the form around that and how we um, understand the governance. So that'll be uh, major bits of work that we'll be undertaking, and um, and that's co-producer. They're very much wanting all places and all the current people who are involved with that to help co-produce that and guide that to make it work. Is that back? It's timed out. Um, so, so yeah. So that hard, that wiring diagram, really, and just understanding it. So, and, and with the executive team, they'll they'll obviously lead that, provide the leadership into that. That's brilliant. Thank you. And any councillor? <laughs> Sorry about this. I'm trying to understand it. And you, I'm, I'm going there a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah. So you're putting in a new system um, with due diligence under lots of these headings. Now, at the other end, the service user, is this to provide a better service for the, the service user or the patient or whatever is at the end of it? Or is it just a change of board and leadership and funding and there's no outcome at the bottom. I'm but, sorry about that, but I'm trying to think. I, I, I think that's it. an absolute fair question, and, and um, you know, our political leaders um, would argue that nothing they're doing isn't about, without reason. Um, and I, I suppose, as leaders within the healthcare system, I've got to uh, believe that um, the architecture of the system is to improve outcomes. Um, uh, for people uh, and you know we've got to look for where we make the system improve outcomes and constantly improve outcomes for, for our residents um, the you, uh, you know, huge discussions now around population health management health inequalities all the things that you will hear about and you will have been scrutinizing and debating um, both within the local authority and, and within this committee um, and the ICB will have at the heart of it an ethos of, of, of levelling up and understanding inequalities and how we improve outcomes. That's been really clear and that's been made really clear with the discussions that the new leadership team are already having. Um, that's what they're aspiring to do. Um, and that's to hold on to what we do well at place, but also look for those opportunities and, and drive improvement. So yes is the answer. Um, it should be all around the, the, the end service user, the patient that's at the end of this. And at the end of the day, that's what the health service is there for. That's the only reason it exists, is to provide a service for those that, that, that need that service. So um, it has to be about um, ensuring we get the right care at the right time um, and that we constantly look to improve the services and accessibility of those services. Sorry, I was just going to say that's a really good quit. That's a really good point, actually, because one of the one of our themes through this panel is we really want to make sure that we kind of bring more emphasis on prevention and obviously that leads really well into that kind of uh, uh, looking at the data of inequalities and making sure that that happens yeah can I just ask you know the due diligence uh, my, my. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm taking over it's just I can't understand it all Thank you for your patience. It's all right, and I can always come back. <laughs> when you come in, when the board is t turning over some from the CPG and you're going all, all down the roads of what you're going down, mm -hmm. showing due diligence and everything else like that, will the due diligence stay with the patient or will it end once everything's in place? Not sure I understand. 
the, 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 the service that the patients get and our communities get shouldn't, doesn't change on the 1st of July. So what's already in place, so, so the, the, the CCG is the commissioning organisation, it's not the provider organisation. Um, so the hospital still continues as the hospital, our dash does, the community, all will continue. So and primary care will continue in exactly the same way. What, the, what will change is where the accountability for commissioning of that is and the oversight and the, the assurance and the commissioning function. Um, and moving forward, we, you know, we've heard a lot about how we change our work at place. So increasingly our providers will work more closely together. The, you know, we'll have collaboratives, we'll have um, provider alliances um, evolving over time. So the way that our GPs, hospitals, community teams, social work teams, how these people work more closely together will change and evolve. And that's at the heart of the place plan and at the heart of some of these changes. But that doesn't happen on the 1st of July. And what, you know, I've, I, I, I was keen to, to, you know, to understand that at the end of the day, people just want to recognise when they've got support needs and understand that they're going to be able to have those needs yeah. met and understood. Um, and that's simply what we're all hoping to achieve in, in whatever work we, we, we're in, that we get the right support and we empower people to A, look after themselves, but when they need care and support as well, that it's available and that the right advice, guidance and support and care is, is, is there when it's needed. So that doesn't change on, on the 1st of July. That's still the aspiration of the system. Yeah. And what we're changing is the commissioning yeah. function that ceases as five and becomes South Yorkshire, South Yorkshire NHS rather than Doncaster CCG. Thank you for indulging me. I'm trying to, it's, I'm trying to work it all out, sorry. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. It, it's you know I've lived and breathed this for the last eighteen months, two years, trying to work this through. So it, it is a complex set of changes that, on the face of it, looks simple, but to make it happen safely and effectively will be complex and um, will take some time to settle. And it, it, we we won't have all the answers on the first of July. As I said, the design bit of this will continue for months and years as we settle into new ways of working and. And um, you know, look to take the you know the opportunities that are in front of us for system working. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for a, um, a very comprehensive look. And obviously, it's not one hundred and ten percent in stone at all, is it? So, um, it, it's even changed since we got told about it. Um, I can't remember when it was. Was it July um, last year? Yeah, um, so, um, and we're all learning in this, so thank you for all your questions as well. Um, Linda, uh, Linda, just because anybody that's watching this means that they can get really good idea of what's happening as well. And, you know, I feel that um, f with your experience, uh, Andrew, and how you've ex explained everything, that um, maintaining that quality assurance and, uh, monitoring throughout the system I feel like the panel and I, um, I feel okay about go going forward with it, everything um, and it's just nice to know how that structure will work so we know what we uh, what to look for um, over the next couple of years when we come back to that kind of quality assurance again, yeah. Yeah. brilliant <laughs> Christine's telling me to take <laughs> turn your mic off um, uh, and uh, I think um, the, that's it for that item. And uh, again, Andrew, just want to um, say thank you so much for all the time. You know how busy you are in this transition and uh, providing us with all that information, detailed information. And if the panel needs any more information, um, if we could ask you back at another at later time, which would be great. Um, thank you for everybody's questions on that. Our next section is, let's get my, uh, the work plan. Um, Christine, could you um, share with us what the work plan is? Thank you, Chair. Um, as usual, every, you know, every time we have a meeting, we circulate the, uh, the scrutiny work plan for you. As you can see, we've got to the end of what is this municipal year. It um, doesn't mean that the work has actually stopped. Um, we have 
a session, I think we're arranging for children's mental health and issues. Um, I think that also may be jointly with um, the children and young people panel. Um, but now if you can see that there are bits and bobs on that work plan that are actually going to move forward to next year and possible thoughts for next year. But what I'd like to ask you is there is, if there is anything that you do want to address in the year coming up after, after May and, um, and annual council, please let us know and we'll make sure that it's on the uh, work planning list of issues for your consideration. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, well, I know that we've got uh, well, the children's mental health and um, services such as uh, speech and language therapy. One is going to be a key one, and it's important that we work across the uh, children's young person panel on that as well. Um, but that should be quite a it, fun, as in like really insightful and really necessary for us. Um, and then I know that as a panel, we're really interested in in looking at housing and social care and, uh, and health in that area. Um, we have said in the past that there were other issues, so I think we need to probably address, uh, look at um, adult mental health um, services. Uh, is there anything else that um, we've talked about over the panels, um, but not? I mean. That's brilliant. Um, I think that's enough for now. I'm sure we keep adding to it, don't we? And we're obviously going to continue following the carers, all carers, age strategy scrutiny um, on that. And we do, I don't know if you've seen, but we do have a, an informal meeting, uh, meeting the carers where they're going to tell us about um, the projects they've been working on to, to get that, uh, embed that strategy with our partners, um, which I'm looking forward to. And so that leads us to um, the recommendations. So the recommendations for this is the scrutiny panel is asked to A, note the work, joint work to prevent and control COVID-19 and the key role that Doncaster's health protection professionals play in coordination and management of the pandemic response. B, note that the ongoing work on a range of health protection programs, including vaccination, and screening, air quality, sexual health, and substance misuse. This also includes progress and challenges on flu vaccinations and MMR amongst vulnerable groups. And C, note assurance on health protection of the Doncaster people. Um, and I would also like to add that we um, just to acknowledge the uh, incredible work that everybody across all our partners healthcare staff, social care staff, um, volunteers, council staff, et cetera, et cetera, have all done over this period of time and in addressing um, the panel today. And I just wanted to say that things that we'll look forward to, uh, to see, so what we can note on is the uh, future consultation um, that social care is gonna do on the future contracts. Um, and also following making sure that we can keep progress on this transition of uh, the CCG into the integrated care system and just ensuring that that Doncaster has a voice and autonomy uh, in assessing the quality and the needs of place and people in Doncaster um, and just the commitment to making sure that we keep hearing people's voice um, through all the different methods um, that's presented to us. Um, is, is, would the panel agree with this? Brilliant. And uh, that draws the meeting to a close, and I'd like to thank everybody for your fantastic questions and uh, engagement. Thank you.